song go back to Christ. See the forest light raise the standard high for the Lord. Get your armor on, stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon His holy word. Rouse them, soldiers, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Strong to meet the full marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light, battling for the right we never can fail. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout the Lord Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throne. O Lord, God of all hear us when we call, help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, we shall wear the crown before thy face. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout the Lord Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throne. Amen. You all may be seated. You probably noticed, as I do on a few hymns, I changed the verses, the last verse, some of the words in that, from may we wear the crown to we shall wear the crown because God has guaranteed it. And that is something that we can base upon scripture and so we thank God for that. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. We are looking at a very important text in Acts chapter 8, a text that involves the spiritual warfare. We see much of that in the New Testament. We see much of that in the world around us today. And unfortunately, many Christians are sound asleep at the switch. They don't even know the battle is going on, much less are they participating in it. And yet we have been called to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. No soldier entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Paul tells that to young Timothy as Timothy goes forth to battle. And we find it also in Ephesians chapter 6 where the Apostle Paul describes the fact that every one of us is involved in spiritual warfare against Satan and his demonic forces. We are given in Ephesians chapter 6 the spiritual armor which we are supposed to be wearing and that was described for us in the hymn which we just sung. We're in Acts chapter 8 and I'll read verses 6 and 7. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the New Testament which articulates for us the spiritual warfare in which we find ourselves, and gives to us the principles upon which we should base that warfare. We pray, Father, that you'll give us an understanding of your word, help us to understand those things that you prohibit in your word and cause us, Father, to be faithful servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, not dabbling with the occult and the things of the enemy. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that we looked at the difference in uncleanness in the Old Testament versus uncleanness in the New Testament. We saw that the term unclean occurs a total of 194 times in the Bible, 162 of those are in the Old Testament, 32 times the word unclean occurs in the New Testament, and that doesn't include all the other words that are related to it as we went through the different passages. Well, uncleanness in the Old Testament is a lot broader than uncleanness in the New Testament. 
It's most frequently in the Old Testament connected to Jewish prohibitions that no longer apply to the church. In general, there were six areas of uncleanness, which we talked about. That which the body consumes, that is food. And in the Old Testament, there were many unclean things that the Jews could not eat and some that they could not even touch. That was ritual uncleanness. And the typological use of the dietary laws is to show that there are divisions from God's perspective in that which is morally and spiritually unclean and with that which is morally and spiritually clean. That's the primary way in which we find it in the New Testament. The restrictions under dietary regulations are removed by the New Testament. In fact, we find quite a number of passages in the New Testament that make it very clear to us that we are no longer under those dietary restrictions. And we went over huge numbers of them, you recall, last week. I mean, uh, everything in the animal kingdom, everything in the uh, creatures that live in the sea, everything that flies in the air, all the different kinds of bugs and so on. Certain ones were clean and certain ones were unclean for Israel to eat. But the two passages or three passages that I'd like to draw your attention to, first of all, in Colossians chapter 2. Because Colossians chapter 2 connects the dietary regulations with several other things that Christians are no longer obligated to be under or to keep. Things that related specifically to Israel. Listen carefully to verses 16 and 17 of Colossians chapter 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Now that's related to the dietary regulations. But listen as he goes on, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. And notice here the plural. We're going to see tonight that there are many different kinds of Sabbaths, not, nearly, not merely the uh, seventh day of the week, the weekly Sabbath, but there were dozens of other high holy days which were also Sabbaths that had to be kept in a particular manner in the Old Testament. And he says to us, the Sabbaths, literally, it's a single word in Greek, but uh, translated Sabbath days, but it's the Sabbaths, plural. Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. We are told specifically that these are typological. They are a shadow of things to come. They're not the reality. They are not the final word. They are a shadow of the things to come. But the body is of Christ. Then we read over in Acts chapter 10, we'll be getting to that in detail, the Lord willing, but I'll give it to you now just to demonstrate where we're going. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 and following. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, and this is the people from Cornelius' household that he sent to call for Peter to come down uh, to give a message to them. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He was waiting for lunch and uh, went into a trance. Now, some of us have gotten hungry, but probably never quite that hungry. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. That takes us back to the dietary laws that we looked at last week. All four categories are listed for us here, and it was four different categories that were listed in the Old Testament where things that were unclean, as stated by God, were to be found. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Peter was a Jew. Peter understood the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now I know that God is teaching him a lesson by using the Old Testament illustrations of unclean things. He's going to prepare Peter to go and speak to Gentiles and actually go in and eat with them. And later Peter is going to get called on the carpet for doing that. But God never uses a false analogy 
never commands to do something that in fact is unclean in and of itself. God was telling Peter, what God has cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. That covers all four categories of the dietary regulations that are in the Old Testament. That means you can eat ham today. That means you can eat shrimp today and lobster today. And if you want to, you can eat octopus and squid. Squid I like, octopus I have never tried. I'm still squeamish about that. But I have the right either to eat it or not to eat it. So do you. I don't know how many of you eat bats and moles and things like that, but if you wish to do so, if you were starving in a camp or saw a rat run by, uh, even though it was an unclean animal in the Old Testament, uh, you would not be violating the Word of God if you caught it, killed it, and ate it. The dietary regulations no longer apply to us today. Romans 14.14. 14. I know and am persuaded he's talking about food here. I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean. To him is unclean. There are still people who have a hang-up in their conscience about eating those things. We don't force it on them. But at the same time, those folks, as Paul explains in Romans 14, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, should not force their conscience upon those who wish to eat those things. They are what are called adiaphorous. It's a big word, but it means neutral. Neither moral nor immoral. The adiaphorous things are the things whereby, unfortunately, many Christians fight with one another. And yet the Apostle Paul puts them in the category of neutrality. Now, the context that we see here in Romans chapter 14, and also as we saw last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, is there are times we choose not to eat to avoid offending a weaker brother. Not because it's prohibited by the Old Testament law, but for the sake of weaker brothers with weak consciences. The stronger brothers can take it or leave it in each situation. But the weaker brother cannot take it or leave it. That is, it's no big deal to the stronger brother one way or another, but the weaker brother, it is a big deal to him one way or the other. Therefore, the stronger brother should be willing to curtail his legitimate liberty. We live in a society which speaks much of liberty, normally thinking of political liberty, especially around times of elections, but we talk about ourselves as having these inalienable rights. When we're dealing with biblical liberty, we're talking about those who are strong in their faith being willing, voluntarily, to curtail their liberties so as not to harm a weaker brother. That's what Paul is dealing with when he deals with the food offered to idols. He says there, there are no cootie germs on the food offered to idols. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. The demonic forces have not polluted it in some way, even though it was offered to demonic forces. But he says, for the sake of a weaker brother, I'm willing to forego my right to eat the best cuts of meat sold in the shambles so that I won't cause that weaker brother to stumble. Most of us want to insist on our rights. Most of us want to push our own way to get our desired right accomplished. But that's not the way a mature Christian acts. And Paul explains that. Something else that's imp important to remember is God, however, does not want weaker brothers to remain weaker brothers. Lots of times a weaker brother discovering that the stronger brother is curtailing his own liberty for the sake of the weaker brother, decides to use that as a manipulation tool. And so he chooses to remain a weaker brother, or at least pretend to do so, so that he can control the stronger brothers by insisting that the stronger brother not do certain things that are actually in the realm of Christian liberty. When a weaker brother tries to do that, they should no longer be classified as weaker brethren, but they should be classified as heretics and disciplined accordingly. A heretic, hieresis, means a schismatic, one who causes divisions in the church. Our goal as stronger brethren is to help weaker brethren grow up, to mature in their Christian faith, and to understand their true liberty in Christ which is not licentiousness, but is a liberty that brings glory to God and keeps us from being placed back under the Mosaic regulations. 
Those who will not grow up but insist on using it as a bludgeon against the church to try to control the church are classified in the New Testament as heretics. There were two areas we talked about. 1 Corinthians 8, the meat offered to idols. Romans 14, 1 through 22, which was the issue of vegetarians, the weaker versus meat eaters, the stronger. Veg the Sabbatarians, the weaker versus the non-Sabbatarians, the stronger. The holiday non-keepers, the weaker versus the holiday keepers, stronger. We saw that the key verse in Romans 14, was Romans 14, 23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Paul uses the illustrations of vegetables versus meat and Sabbatarianism versus non-Sabbatarianism to establish a baseline principle which applies in all areas of the Christian life. That is, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, if you've been with us in the Sunday mornings, we've been talking about the gift of faith and how that is essential for Christian living, how that is essential for the exercise of whatever other service gift God has given you to minister to the body of Christ. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It's not merely that the one who breaks the law, you know, has uh, committed sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. That is true. But that is not all that sin is. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. God doesn't just merely have a negative definition of sin. He tells us that the absence of faith in what we do is also sin. That's what the walk of faith deals with. Every day, every choice, every attitude, every word, every action, every motive, every thought, not most, but every. The walk of faith includes it all. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. Now, I'm adding some new material in here tonight that we didn't cover last week. That's been our review. And I want us to understand this because it, it's really important, especially in a society which talks a lot about liberty, but they mean license. And on the other hand, people in the church who talk about our freedom in Christ and yet put us back under the law. Very difficult to maintain the correct balance between those two extremes because some churches are one way on the far left and some churches are the other way on the far right. There are other reasons for selecting one or other choice in these and many other neutral areas. For example, the church, I lived there for a year, Judy lived there for two, the church in modern day Israel meets on Saturday. But they don't meet on Saturday because it is the Sabbath for the church. But because that is the only non-work day in Israel. And the Jews consider Saturday correctly still to be the Sabbath for the Jews. They work six days a week over there. They don't work five days a week like we do here. It's a normal six-day work week and then they take Saturday off. It's the only day that Christians living in Israel who actually have jobs and work in the society have free and there is no provision for Christians or for Muslims who meet on Friday to take the day off to do their worship. Unlike here in the United States, there are all kinds of laws that protect people you know, who have religious consciences about various things. In Israel, if you want to worship, you do it on Saturday because that's national law. And so the Christians, not because it is the Sabbath, but because that's the day they have off, is the day that they worship. Remember the Apostle Paul said, one holds one day above another and other man holds every day alike. Let every man be convinced in his own heart. Well, the Jews who are Christians in Israel and others who are also Christians, perhaps Gentiles who live and work in Israel for some reason or other, they go to church on Saturday. The first day of the week, was never changed to the Sabbath. I know we talk about Sunday being the Sabbath, but you won't find that in the New Testament. You won't find it in the Old Testament, and certainly we're not controlled by the intertestamental books. There is no place in the Scripture that says that the Sabbath was any day other than Saturday. Now, I know we like to make theological applications, and you can make some applications, but Sunday is really not the Sabbath. The Sabbath in Scripture 
always refers either to one of the high holy days or to the seventh day of the week. Every place it occurs in the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Exodus 35.2 Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be unto you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord, whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Now, that's a pretty strong command. If that relates to the church, you can't pick and choose which parts you like and then switch it over to another day. It says it's a day of rest. The Sabbath was never, in the Old Testament, a day of worship. Did you know that? All seven days were days of worship. People were bringing their sacrifices to the tabernacle and later to the temple Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Every day of the week. The Sabbath was set apart as a day of rest, not as a day of worship. We consider Sunday, certainly we rest on it if we can. It's a nice time to get a break someplace, at least for this preacher. I sleep usually on Sunday afternoons just to get my strength up for tonight. But it's a day of worship for us, not merely a day of rest. That was not the case with Israel in the Old Testament. The church is not under the law of Sabbath, just as we are not under the dietary laws of Israel. They are put together in Romans. They are put together in 1 Corinthians. They are put together in the book of Acts. They are put together in the book of Colossians as things that are shadows of that which is to come. Both the Sabbath and the dietary laws of Israel are connected as no longer pertaining to the church. The reason we meet on the first day of the week is to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, not to celebrate God's covenant with national Israel made at Mount Sinai. And I'm not guessing at that. I'm not guessing at the purposes of the Sabbaths, either the weekly Sabbath or the high holy Sabbaths, in relation to Israel. That's the Sabbath, plural, and the holy days of Colossians 2, 16 and 17, which don't apply to the church, because we know what the purpose for the Sabbath was. Exodus chapter 31, 13. The first purpose of the Sabbath is to remember the Mosaic covenant at Mount Sinai. Beginning in verse 13, Exodus 31. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths, plural, not just the weekly Sabbath, ye shall keep. Now here's the key. For it is a sign between me and you, not between God and the church, but between God and Israel, throughout your generations, that is, perpetually, generation after generation for Israel, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Do you get that? If we are under the law of the Sabbath, we are under the entire law of the Sabbath. You don't find any place where the Sabbath has been purged of its penalties. You don't find any place where the Sabbath has been transferred to the first day of the week. You don't find any place where it is designed to take you back to the covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. The church is not under the law. This was a purpose of the Sabbath to remind Israel of Mount Sinai. And the book of Hebrews tells us you have not come unto the mount that burned and smoked and was on fire. Where so much as a, a beast touched it, it was supposed to be killed. The Sabbath is to remind Israel of a holy righteous God that will kill you if you disobey him. Anybody who violates the Sabbath shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto the Lord. Not in the first, but in the seventh. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Verse 17, it is a sign, that is the Sabbath, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. The one command that God pulled out of all the commands to talk about it and emphasize it right before he handed those tables of stone to Moses that God himself had inscribed with his own finger, the thing that he pulled out was to say, now the way you're going to remember the covenant that I'm giving to you, these Ten Commandments, the way you're going to remember it is the Sabbath. And if you don't keep the Sabbath, I'm going to kill you. That's serious business, folks. It's designed first to prove to Israel that God made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai that was a covenant of condemnation, not a covenant of grace. It was a covenant of condemnation that anybody who violated the Sabbath, which is always the seventh day of the week, would be put to death. The second purpose of the Sabbath was to remember the Egyptian bondage and God's deliverance. Deuteronomy chapter 5, which again is in the context of the Ten Commandments. Two places the Ten Commandments are given. We find them given in Exodus, and we find them given in Deuteronomy. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Two things. The purpose of the Sabbath was, number one, to remind Israel of the covenant of the law on Mount Sinai. A perpetual covenant for Israel throughout their generations. The penalty for breaking it was death. The second reason that God gave the Sabbath to Israel was to remind them of their Egyptian bondage and the miraculous deliverance that God gave them out of Egypt. There are other Sabbath days besides the seventh day of the week. I won't go through all of them, but I'll give you a few samples. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the American Jews say. Yom Kippur. Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by statute forever. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, not a temporary statute, an everlasting statute to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, as he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Do we keep the Day of Atonement? No, Christ has fulfilled it. If he has fulfilled these high holy days, does it not strike you as passing odd that he would not also have fulfilled the regular Sabbath, which, of course, the book of Hebrews teaches us that he has done? We have a Sabbath rest in Christ, not commemorated by the death penalty, remembrance of Mount Sinai, and the giving of the law. The Feast of Trumpets was a holy Sabbath, a high holy day. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. The Feast of Tabernacles and first fruits was a holy Sabbath. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fiftieth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. Which was the point of the Sabbath, not doing work. It wasn't a matter of worship. It was a matter of not doing work. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, a meat offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything upon his day. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, verse 38, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your freewill offerings, which you give unto the Lord. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you are gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Same word used. Exactly the same word as for the weekly Sabbaths. Are you still doing these things? Do you even know what they all are? You think you're keeping the Sabbath by going to church on Sunday? 
and watching football games in the afternoon. It's a strange concept that is not founded in Scripture because the law is a unit. You cannot pick and choose from the law. If you are under the law, you're under the whole law. But the New Testament makes certain statements for us that God had typological pictures in the law which pointed us to something else. There are certain moral things that are restated for us. Nine of the Ten Commandments are restated for us in the New Testament with a higher standard than they had under the Old Testament. For example, how about thou shalt not steal? The Apostle Paul writes and says, Let him that soul steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The Old Testament just prohibited you from stealing. Don't steal. The New Testament says, let him that steals steal no more. Okay, that much is the same as the Old Testament. But it goes farther. The responsibility of the Christian is not just to avoid petty theft. The responsibility of the Christian is, number one, to work, and number two, so that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's a far greater cry than the commandment, thou shalt not steal. The Lord Jesus Christ made this clear when he spoke of the commandments concerning murder and adultery. He told us that the Old Testament said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. Different words for killing in the Old Testament, that one relates to murder. Not to accidental manslaughter, but to murder. Not to the killing of an animal, but to murder. So as you've heard it said, and well they had, they'd heard the Ten Commandments. Jesus says, I say unto you, anybody that hates his brother without a cause is guilty of murder. He raises the bar higher than the Old Testament to demonstrate that we are all guilty. The law does not save you. The law does not sanctify you. The law condemns you. And that's the point at which God steps in with his grace when we are convinced that we are sinners and saves us. The purpose of the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Not the purpose of the law is something that we must slavishly follow so that somehow we can earn God's favor. Moving on. Feast of Passover, that's most clearly illustrated for us at the crucifixion of Christ. John chapter 19, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. It was one of the high holy days. Passover was a Sabbath. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Did you know that the law of the Sabbath also applied to the land every seven years? If we're still under the Sabbath, why don't we do this as a matter of divine law? Now I know there are principles about crop rotation and all that kind of stuff, and people do it every four years uh, to rotate the crops to make sure the nitrogen is in the soil by planting legumes and things like that. But we're talking once every seven years by divine command, not as a matter of agricultural expertise. Notice what God said. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year, not in the first year, in the seventh year, Sabbath is always the seventh, shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. We've already seen, but I'll point it out again, the violation of the Sabbath was a capital crime punishable by death. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now, I said it before, but let me now give you the scripture references for it. The law is a unit. You cannot take part of the law and exclude the rest of the law without divine authority to do so. God gave the divine authority in relation to foods and in relation to special days, including the Sabbaths, Colossians chapter 2, which we looked at a few moments ago. 
But let me point out that the law is a unit. James chapter 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The law is like a chain. I think I've used this illustration but several years ago, so let me use it again. Up at West Point, back in the 1800s, there was a gigantic chain that stretched across the river where West Point Military Academy is located. There's a gigantic chain to keep enemy ships from coming up the river and getting past that point. It had huge links in the chain that would stop a ship going full blast. It would crush into the wood of the ship, anchored firmly into the stone cliffs on either side. Now, tell me, how many of those links would have to be broken for the chain to be broken and a ship to pass through? How many? One. That's what James is saying about the law. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He has broken the law. He didn't have to sit down and meticulously eat a crab and a shrimp and an octopus and a, a scallop and, you know, a sea urchin and some shark, uh, which don't have, you know, they have fins but they don't have scales. Uh, he didn't have to sit down and eat a an buzzard and an osprey and, you know, to be able to break all the law. If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. James is explaining to us that our works are not what saves us and our works are not what sanctifies us. Back to our review from last week, the other areas where there was Old Testament as uncleanness was in the birthing process. Uh, we saw that there's uncleanness in the Old Testament referring to that which comes out of the body. Um, reproductive discharge, for example, other things that come out of the body, bodily excretions of various kinds. And we went through the passages dealing with that. But the New Testament also speaks about things that defile a man, that are unclean, that come out of the heart. And our Lord Jesus Christ gave us those illustrations. The fourth way unclean is used in the Old Testament refers to defilement by touching a dead body. The fifth way it's used in the Old Testament refers to certain kinds of diseases like unclean, leprosy. And leprosy could be not merely in a person, but also leprosy in houses, leprosy in clothing, and so on. And you'd have your house torn down if your house had leprosy of types. So tonight, we move back to part four. The serious penalties for violating laws of uncleanness. We've been talking about the unclean spirits that Philip cast out in Acts chapter 8. The soul that shall touch any unclean thing as the uncleanness of man or any unclean beast or any abominable unclean thing and either the flesh of sacrifice or peace offerings were pertain unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Capital punishment for being involved in that which was unclean. Because God's people were supposed to be a holy people and that was what was being symbolized by the law of uncleanness. The Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. But as we move into the New Testament, the focus related exclusively to uncleanness from moral impurity, everything from self-gratification to sodomy and even worse sins such as bestiality and necrophilia. And if you don't know what those mean, you ought to look them up in the dictionary. It goes on all around us in this country today. So we move now to the healings that Philip, Philip did. What were the principal ones that are mentioned here in Samaria? It says that many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. Verse 7. The word translated palsies here is paraluktiktos from paraluo, to loosen alongside, to loosen, um, or to be paralyzed. That is, to be weakened in your muscles. The muscles become loosened so that they cannot function properly. 
It's a word that relates to the dissolving of muscle, muscle, nerves, joints, tendons, ligaments, and bones, all becoming disjointed because a weakness occurs in some area of those parts of the body. There are multiple diseases that we know about today that can cause that weakening condition. Strokes can cause it. Multiple sclerosis can cause it. Muscular dystrophy can cause it. Lou Gehrig's disease can cause it. Many other diseases can cause that kind of a weakening condition and ultimately end in paralysis. Now, I'm going to give you some illustrations, and this is only speculation. These illustrations are only speculation. But it crossed my mind that there are really only two types of healings that are going on here that are listed for us in Samaria. It may have been, this is speculation, put it down as such, it may have been a special genetic condition prevalent among the Sumerian, Samaritans because of inbreeding. That is true among the Samaritans today. Um, the Samaritans today have certain common genetic defects and diseases in the area of mental retardation because of their inbreeding. In terms of diseases that cause a paralysis or an inability to walk, very much like German shepherds, you know, purebred German shepherds, a lot of them have a hip disease that makes them crippled even at a young age. In a particular area, of KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa, which is just south of the Mozambique border. So think of South Africa, go all the way to the north. You're in the Zulu territory when you get up to the north. That's just south of Mozambique. Our son Ariel worked while he was in medical school. He did a 10-week a rotation in KwaZulu-Natal at the uh, Msalini Hospital. And he worked with a Christian surgeon from Great Britain who was a missionary doctor in that area. And he would fly out to the bush and actually examine patients and actually do surgeries out in the jungle. They'd fly out in a small plane, stop, the surgeries would go on, minor surgeries in some hut somewhere. Then they would fly to the next location and so on. But they had a hospital in Imsalini. And there was what was known as the Imsalini hip disease. And young men and young women in their middle 20s would become crippled because of the degeneration of the bones in the hip. And so here would come a young man who would otherwise be a powerful warrior, staggering into the hospital or carried into the hospital for days by his friends. And this particular doctor and Ariel would perform hip joint replacements, ultra-modern prosthetic devices that were given free to the hospital by a company in Germany. And so they would operate, remove the diseased bone, give him this high-tech nylon and stainless steel replacement, sew him back up, elevate his legs for a couple of days. The guy would finally get up, put on his loincloth, pick up his spear and walk back into the jungle. <laughs> but it was crippling an entire population of people. That was the primary thing that they did at that hospital. We find that there are other types of diseases like that. The Ashkenazi Jewish population, there is a very high incidence of Tay-Sachs disease. It's almost exclusive to that population of people. The Afro-American population has a high incidence of sickle cell anemia. Now, I know it's not true of all the people in these various populations, but it is significantly above average for that population. Throughout the ministry of Christ, he also healed many of the palsy, which is what we see going on here, many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, such as the man who was let down, for example, through the roof. The other word, and I remember that's just speculation as to it might have been a thing within that population that God sent Philip there. It was a thing that was known to them. It was a thing that they, many of them suffered from because many of them taken with this were healed by Philip. It was something God did supernaturally within that population of people. I can't prove that. But perhaps the text gives us a little suggestion to that effect because the second disease is very similar to it. They were lame, kalos, crippled, halt, lame, limping. The word is used not only of those who are crippled from age or injury, but also those who are born incompletely formed limbs, such as the man who was lame from his mother's womb, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 2. Now, there's something that ties these two types of healings together. It is physical mobility, the ability to walk, the ability to care for oneself rather than being a beggar. The healing brought them back to a state where they could care for themselves rather than having to have others take care of them. 
You know, the same thing is true of us spiritually when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are no longer lame. We are no longer halt spiritually. We're no longer blind. We're no longer dead. But by the grace of God, he has given us his spirit so that we can function as we should. Now, it's interesting that it's in the, uh, the context of demons here also because many that had demons had the demons cast out by Philip. It wasn't a rare occurrence. It was a very common occurrence. Demons can cause physical infirmity, but not all physical infirmity is the result of a demonic attack. For example, where we see demons causing, or the devil himself in this case, causing infirmity is Job. Uh, God gave jo the devil permission to go down and cover Job with boils. And he had him from the crown of his head to the foot of his, the sole of his feet. An incredibly painful condition. Satan gave him a disease that he would feel. And yet he did not curse God. Of course, there are many other illustrations in the Gospels of deaf and dumb who were uh, the result of demonic forces. Note something else. Demons can enter and exit certain people at will. They cannot come into a Christian. A person who is truly saved is indwelt permanently by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God will not share his residence with a demon. But with certain other people, demon possession is not always continuous. It can be periodic. And as a result, it can be deceptive, as the person may appear normal and may even appear to be saved, though salvation is not real in those instances, but merely a matter of self-reformation, which is what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 12. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, so he can go in and out, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. What is his house? The man out of whom the unclean spirit just left. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. The demon left and the man did some self-reformation. He tried to get his act together. But you know what? That's not enough to keep the demon out of him. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. There are demonic forces and within the demonic forces are levels of wickedness. There are demonic forces that are even more wicked than unclean spirits. It said it was the unclean spirit that went out and now he's taking in seven more that are even more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now listen to the last phrase that Jesus says in Matthew 12:45. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Jesus was prophesying that because of the rejection of his offer of salvation, it would be like people who had self-reformed and seven more wicked demons would enter into the man and his end state would be worse than his first state. Jesus compared the generation of Noah with the closing generations of this age in which we find ourselves. If it's going to be that way with that wicked generation, what we see today is even more intense because we are looking imminently for the return of Christ, is more intense than it was back in those days. Even so shall it also be unto this wicked generation. Like at Samaria, there were many who were demon-possessed. Perhaps the best illustration of this principle of a demon being able to enter into and go out of, and the deception that that causes, it's probably the best illustration is Judas. Judas appeared to be the most faithful disciple financially. He was chosen to carry the money of the Jewish disciples. Did it ever strike you as passing strange that not Matthew, who is also known as Levi, the one who was the tax collector, he was not the one who was chosen, even though he had obvious money skills. Perhaps he had been asked and he refused to do it because he knew the temptation of money. But even the businessmen in the group were not chosen to carry the money. Peter, Andrew, and John were businessmen. They were fishermen. They ran a regular fishing business. That's the way they supported themselves and their families. 
Judas was specifically chosen for that job because Judas was a man who had certain character qualities with which he would betray Christ. Judas was not a man who had trusted in Christ. Judas was a man who was an opportunist and saw the chance to get hold of the money and to get hold of fame and fortune as he followed Jesus, the miracle worker, around and was counted among the twelve. Did it ever occur to you also that when Jesus sent out the 70 and when he gave authority to the 12, that among that was the business of casting out demons? Judas was the perfect plant. Listen to what it says in John 13. What we see here is Satan was able to enter Judas at will, and Judas gave no resistance. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned unto him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Not one of them suspected Judas, even though they had been told that Jesus was going to hand a sop to the one who would betray him, and the first one he handed a sop to immediately after he said that was Judas. Not one of the disciples picked up on it because they trusted Judas so much. Satan entered into him at will. And it says, And he, having received the sop, went immediately out. And John, in his graphic way, leaves us with the phrase, And it was night. Christ was recognized by the unclean spirits. Mark chapter 3. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Did you know that unclean spirits are also related to the unpardonable sin? Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. He called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verse 38. Jesus gives all that background to tell us one thing, to tell us about the unpardonable sin. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wheresoever with they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And now he explains what this unpardonable sin is in verse 30. Because, they said, he, speaking of Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. They were accusing the Lord Jesus Christ of moral defilement with an unclean spirit when he was always filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Four things that we learn from this. Number one, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not a matter of using the name of the Holy Spirit with a curse word. That's not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There have been people who tried to deliberately blaspheme the Holy Spirit by using the Holy Spirit's name with a curse word. That's not what we see in this passage. Number two, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not the sin of unbelief. There are many who teach that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the sin of unbelief. Because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is never forgiven, according to this text. Never forgiven. And yet the sin of unbelief is forgiven every day when a sinner trusts Christ. He has been in a state of unbelief. In fact, he may have resisted for years and said, I do not believe in Jesus Christ. That's the sin of unbelief. But at the moment he trusts Christ, it is forgiven. Number three, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be committed today because we do not see Jesus doing miracles and then attribute his miracles to the power of Satan. That's what they were doing in this passage. They said he has an unclean spirit. That's how he casts out devils. Number four, do not let the charismatics scare you when you refuse to believe in their counterfeit miracles. And then they say, you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I've had charismatics say that to me back when I was in college days. Just remember, those miracles are not of Christ. They're being done, and supernatural powers do manifest themselves through demonic forces. But they're not Christ, these people who do the miracles, and their miracles, though in some cases supernatural, are not the miracles of Christ. A good illustration of this is in our text here in verse 9 and following. In verse 9 it says, There was a certain man called Simon, which before in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Now he's using sorcery. He's not from God. He's from the devil. But what do the people think? They think he's from God because they see miraculous, powerful things happening. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched, that's the second time this is used in this, phrase, in this passage, them with sorceries. Second time the word sorceries is used here in this text. Now I cannot see the clock in the back. What time is it right now? 8.18? Okay, we're three minutes over time. So we will pick up with Simon and what are the different types of sorcery and magic that God condemns in the Bible. Did you know there are dozens of them? Many, many different words, both in Old Testament and New Testament, where God places a death penalty on people who practice those things. Very serious issues indeed. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and the fact that it gives us such severe warnings against any occultic practices that we might dabble with. And Christians do dabble in some of these things. And they pay the consequences, very serious consequences. Father, we pray that you will cause us to be a people that is always on the alert because we are always in a spiritual war, always in danger of attack, always in danger of being led off on the wrong path always in danger of those who would seek to somehow cause us to stumble so that they can attack us from the rear without our sword in our hand. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it has gone forth tonight. Very serious things. And yet, Father, it is written many times for our warning, for our caution, and so that we might be faithful in the spiritual battle to which you have called us. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.